Welcome to Organic One. We are going to be looking at the fourth edition of Klein's Organic Chemistry, and we're going to start in chapter two. If you have any topics from general chemistry that you need to brush up on, if I talk too quickly about Vesper theory or hybridization, something that we learned in general chemistry, you can always refer to chapter one. In the Wiley Plus access that you are going to get for your homework, there are links to all of the chapter one materials if you need to brush up on them. So let's just jump right into chapter two. In this first video, we're just going to focus on the first few sections and really discuss molecular representations and how we communicate about compounds. Um, the next video will really step through the functional groups that you have to memorize. But in this video, we're really going to focus on, oh, I've already made some notes here. We're really going to focus on the different ways we can communicate or represent different compounds. Now, in organic chemistry, we're studying carbon-based chemistry, and we're going to find ways that that can simplify these representations. But first, let's touch on some representations that you're already familiar with. So we know that molecular formulas are useful because they tell us which elements and how many atoms of each are present in a molecule. However, when we talk about something like C3H8O, that is ambiguous. There are different ways that those three elements in that number could be arranged. And I'm going to skip ahead two slides to, to look at that. All right, so C3H8O could be rearranged where the three carbons are in a row and the oxygen is on the middle carbon. It could be the three carbons in a row with the oxygen on the end, like in propanol. The oxygen could also be between the carbons, like in ethyl methyl ether. So while the molecular formula is useful, it really doesn't, it's, it doesn't pin down which compound we're looking at. So we usually need some sort of structure <clears throat> when we want to think about how are those three carbons and eight hydrogens and oxygen put together. And so we, have, we started with, in general chemistry, looking at Lewis structures. If we're talking about isopropanol, isopropyl alcohol, we have three carbons with single bonds in a line, the oxygen in the, coming off the middle carbon with a hydrogen. This is called an alcohol functional group. We have our lone pairs. And then the rest of the hydrogens are found with single bonds to the carbons. Now we can see how all of the atoms are arranged in relationship with, to one another. Now, Lewis structures can, I mean, are great, but this is a small molecule. If we had to draw out every compound with this much detail, I would probably still be in grad school. So we find ways to condense. Now, partially condensed structure, like you see here on the PowerPoint, takes out the single bonds between um, elements and hydrogen. And one of the reasons we can do that is because hydrogen typically forms one single bond. <clears throat> so, for instance, you get the CH3s on either side here, the OH up above, and then we draw out the H to the bottom so that we can clearly still show the single bonds between the carbon the the carbon carbon single bonds. This can still be tricky when you are trying to use, say, a computer, and you just want to type out a condensed structure in a single line. So it still gives you a lot of information. It's a little bit more condensed than a Lewis structure, but the completely condensed structure allows you to type a molecule out in a single line. So looking at this Lewis structure, we're starting with the fact that we have two carbons that have three hydrogens around them, right? So this group here and this group here are identical. And they both happen to be attached. So we put a two on the outside of the parentheses because we have two of them. They're both attached to the center carbon. So that comes next. 
Now that center carbon is attached to a hydrogen and an oxygen. Since hydrogen can't be in the middle, we're going to list that next because then it's not confusing that what comes after that hydrogen, the oxygen, we know it has to be attached to this carbon here because the hydrogen can't be in the middle. It can't form two bonds. And then we put the H for this one up here out on the end. As we talk about specific functional groups, we will talk about uh, common shorthand for them in condensed structure. This is the first one. Alcohols, you're usually going to see that OH together. Um, this takes a little bit more from you to uh, break out, right? To, to translate from condensed to Lewis. But it gives you a lot more information than, say, the molecular formula. Right, there are some rules to that, and there are some practice problems within this first section of Klein where you can practice going from condensed structure to Lewis structure and back if that starts, if that is confusing for you. This is a way that we communicate, and so it's good to practice with that early on. All right, so we have uh, three possibilities here of varying complexity, but that all give you information about the order in which the elements or the atoms are attached. All right, going to be Im important to include one of those because that molecular formula, as we mentioned here on this slide, is inadequate. All right, molecular formula can represent several different compounds. Now, another limitation of the Lewis structure is complexity. All right, so when we look at amoxicillin, which is a bigger molecule, and we look at the Lewis structure, all of the atoms, all of the bond lines present, it gets bulky and it gets kind of confusing. And since we are in organic chemistry and we're focusing on the chemistry of carbon, something that can be really useful for us is bond line representation. Compare amoxicillin's Lewis structure to its bond line structure here. Much cleaner. You'll notice that we've left out a lot of the hydrogens. Now, not all of the hydrogens. You still see the hydrogens on nitrogen and oxygen here. But all of the hydrogens on carbon are just gone. All of the Cs representing carbons are gone. We just now see lines, lines connecting to each other. And the reason we can do this is because carbon bonds in a, in a very predictable way. All right, so we will still get the order in which elements are connected to each other, but we will be able to simplify it a little bit. We won't have to write out every element. We won't have to write out hydrogens. And so it can be easier to see functional groups. For instance, now that alcohol is really popping out to me, I can see a carboxylic acid here and an amine, right? You are going to memorize those functional groups. Again, it's coming up in a, a, a few slides from now. How do we decide wh which elements to draw, which elements not to draw? Why can we leave some hydrogen out, hydrogens out and not others? Well, it has to do with the number of bonds carbon can have. Something that you will notice time and again is this um, zigzag. Um, so you see that here with hexane. And this is C6H14. Each end point or place where two bonds connect represents a carbon. So you can see all six carbons here in this bond line formula. The reason that we use the zigzag has to do with the geometry. Tetrahedral and trigonal planar geometries will tend to come together to give a zigzag. Something that you will notice is you see the zigzag with all single bonds. You'll see that when you have double bonds, but frequently you won't see it with triple bonds. That has to do with a linear Sorry, that has to do with a linear um, molecular geometry, right? Now, 
when I do a triple bond, sometimes I still will draw it as a zigzag. It, the geometry is linear, but the sort of the vertex is clearer this way. And so I don't mind if you draw it this way or the way I drew it first. It's just, I like to make it very clear that that's one, two, three, four carbons. One, two, three, four. It's, it's just to make sure that when we count our carbons, we don't lose one. Now, the carbon atoms are not as labeled, but as I said, they're assumed to be at the corner or end point on the zigzags where two bonds come together and the H's are left out. Now, why is that? It's because carbon... When it is neutral, so let's put neutral in here. Neutral carbon forms four bonds. So just like hydrogen forms one, carbon forms four. So if we have the bonds drawn, we want them to add up to four. And if they don't add up to four, whatever is left is hydrogen. So for instance, and let's go to... Um, that hexane again. This carbon only has one bond, so we assume that there are three hydrogens attached to it. The next carbon has two bond lines, right? So one, two. So it would have two hydrogens. So I'm going to use a little, uh, no, not a highlighter. Let's change colors here. I'm going to draw a little red line to indicate where the hydrogens are. So there would be three hydrogens, two, 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 and then three. And then that adds up to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 hydrogens. All right. So if we wrote out the full condensed structure, it would be C, CH2, CH2, CH2. CH2, CH3, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. When we look at the example over here in the PowerPoint, we have a different functional group. We have a ketone, but it's the same idea, right? This carbon here attached to the oxygen already has one, two, three, four bond lines. So you notice there are no hydrogens on that carbon, right? So we can leave hydrogens off of carbon because you're going to have as many as, 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 oh, sorry, goodness, as is needed to give that carbon four bonds. So you can do practice with these things. We already looked at, for instance, hexane, and then we can, we can practice on some others. Let's look at this one here. We're going to have three hydrogens on all of the end carbons and then one hydrogen for those carbons that are in the middle so that each carbon has four bonds. If we look at something a little bit more complex like this guy at the bottom, we would have a hydrogen here because that carbon has three bonds this carbon would have no hydrogens, right? And you can go on and, add, and, and assess every carbon in this manner. But you notice there is an SH. You can only leave hydrogen off of carbon. If it's attached to any other atom, you have to put it in there. All right, so some, some of the rules in drawing these bond line structures, the zigzag, I, it's the ideal way to draw it. We don't always do a perfect job at that, but it does represent the sp2 and sp3 hybridization. It represents the tetrahedral, tetrahedral or trigonal planar bond angles the best. The issue with this rule too, it, it isn't good. <laughs> For sure, because this is a trigonal planar molecule, so you're going to have about 120 degree bond angles, but this isn't going to, 
You're not going to lose credit for that, say, in your homework or on a lab report. You're still showing the atoms connected in the proper way. It's just, it's just not ideal. And then rule three is to remember that when we're dealing with single bonds, the direction that the bonds are drawn doesn't matter because you have free rotation around single bonds. So in the end, these are just two representations of the same thing. And it's because this bond right here can rotate. When we get to naming in chapter four, if that part confuses you, all you have to do is name the compound and you'll recognize that these two images have the same name. And if they have the same name, they are the same thing. Now, the cardinal rule, never drawing more than four bonds to a carbon, that is an extension of the octet rule. Carbon is in the second row of the periodic table, so it cannot have more than an octet around it. And so you cannot have more than four bonds, right? Because each bond represents two electrons. So in organic chemistry, we stay a lot in that fourth, sorry, in that second row. We deal with carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen quite a bit. And so the octet rule really does help us out quite a bit. The bond line structure makes it easier to identify functional groups, which we will spend a significant part of this semester and really in the whole year of organic chemistry, studying the properties and reactivities of different functional groups. And you can see how much more clear the reaction is here of a double bond with hydrogen when we have bond line structure because it very clear we had a double bond and now the double bond is gone. Whereas when you're dealing with the condensed structure, it, it's, it doesn't really jump out at you in quite the same way. So we like to use bond line structure for ease of communication, to simplify things, but also to make functional groups stand out. Now, identifying functional groups is the first task that I am giving you. You have to memorize your functional groups. Anytime I ask you to just do rote memorization, I try to give you a heads up as early as possible. You will be quizzed on functional groups on uh, your quiz during week two. It will be on exam one. But even more important than that, it is the basis for us to communicate throughout the entire year. So if you don't learn what an aldehyde is now, Every time I bring up the term aldehyde throughout the semester, you will be confused. And then by the time you get to organic two and you have to study aldehydes, you're going to be way behind. All right. So we need to memorize table 2.1. I am the next video. I'm going to go through each of these functional groups with you. But if you are a note card person, I recommend making note cards at this point. I did not make a lot of note cards in school, but I did for my functional groups and it helped quite a bit. I'm going to end here because the next uh, two videos, you will have one about the functional groups and then we'll get into formal charges in the third part. All right. See you soon.